So I'm sitting here with Vinnie Golia. Um, Vinnie and I uh, are going to play some music. We have played some music, and we're going to play some more music. And uh, before we do, uh, I thought we would just sit down and talk a little bit. Um, hey, Vinnie. How you doing? When you want to do the talk? I think we just did it. Oh. Yeah, I was just. How many horns do you own? I'm, I'm curious. I've never known how many you actually you actually. Uh, have. Well, Western horns is. No, things things. Yeah, well. Well, West. I mean, because I have whatever horns you define for, as something that you play on a semi. -regular well, I play basis. a lot of things on on regular bass, but they're not all Western. You know, like Western horns, or, or uh, I have about 55 uh, of them. You know, that's different clarinets and saxophones and flutes. And, yeah. And stuff like that. And uh, and then uh, things from other parts of the world. Yeah. Winds from other parts of the world. Like I have, you know, things from Tibet and things from China and things from Japan and right, Africa, right, right. et cetera, et cetera. And this is just stuff you picked up on traveling around? Pretty much. And then people, sometimes people bring you stuff. That's the best. Like they said, oh, I thought of you. I was in such and such, and I heard this, yeah. and I bought it, you know. And now I'll say like, oh, can I? I'll buy it from you. And and he says, no, no, it's a gift for you. I mean, and they give you these magnificent things, you know. And that starts you off on finding like, oh, is there a soprano one? Is there a bass one? <laughs> you know. And then you you do the research, yeah. and you find like all these different variants on this thing that somebody gave you. And then you get a whole family of, of these, and you put them here, and you and your wife goes crazy, saying, "We have no space. Why, do you, why are you buying more?" <laughs> oh yeah, so we got two questions that I'm thinking about. One is, is it what's the horn that you'd like to have that you don't have? Like with 55 of them, is there anything like your what's on your bucket list horn? What's your bucket list horn? Well, that's an interesting that you question. Don't own, I haven't thought about that. That you covet. Um, covet. That, that you need. That you want. Well, I would like maybe a sub contrabass saxophone, although they're, it's impractical. You can't really bring it anywhere, and you can't, and all it does is make a little fart sound, you know? I mean, so, so the I, don't see the, I don't see the real use of it, but I would like to get uh, a, more of the traditional giant yeah, the, uh, contrabass saxophone. Like the one Braxton plays. That, yeah, that but made by Eppelsheim, he makes one. Oh, okay. And it goes down to low A. Wow. So I mean, it's a real honker, and it's a great, <laughs> a great instrument, you know. Yeah. And it's useful, because see, like when you have a like a contra instrument in B flat, yeah. like the contra bass clarinet, for example, it's One a great harmony instrument for something underneath. Yep. When you have a E flat, like contra alto, then that horn speaks more, and it's and it, you can hear the lines better. If I play really fast on the contra uh, bass clarinet, yeah. it sounds like... Yeah, except right? you, you knew Ralph Carney, right? Yeah. So Ralph, I used to, I had him on a couple of albums, and he played contra bass clarinet, one of my favorite instruments in the world. Oh, I you, can get, you can get some beautiful... He made one. Eppelsheim made a new one, a new version. I mean, you can yeah. get extremely virtuosic on those things. and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and... and rodents will come to see you play because <laughs> you scared them i have to play this cut on one of my albums that ralph played on but he's yeah way down, way down low but it's yeah. but it's still still beautiful and, and then the other thing is don't you feel guilty like you know with you have so many horns but you don't play them all the time and you just you know don't you do... horns i don't play i sell how many films have you scored i didn't know your films scored them when did you score 13 films that i don't know about and then in the 90s into 2000 when it was you know like when they had before package deals came and eliminated the entire that whole strata of movies, so that would be for anywhere from twenty thousand to fifty thousand dollar budget, yeah. for, for, which isn't a lot by Hollywood standards. However, for a guy playing improvised music, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a lot of money, you know. Are, yeah. And so I got my contrabass flute that way. I got my contrabass saxophone. <laughs> I got my bass saxophone. I got the Eppelshine contrabass yeah. clarinet. I got a, 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 a soprano in G, a bunch of stuff that, that all was like from making money on, in films because, right. you know, you also get residuals for a while. Absolutely. So yeah. any scores that, that I would know about? No. No. Some of them, you know, they were like um, actors coming up like uh, Michael Madsen's uh, Trouble Bound mm -hmm. and... Uh, the woman's name, but I did one with Jennifer Beale. Um, um, I did not know this. One this with is... Billy Zane. Really? Yeah. Um, 
one with the, oh my favorite with Darren McGavin. <laughs> Got to meet Darren McGavin. Oh man, that was cool. That one's cool. He played an old cranky guy. Yeah. So what's that called? What was that called? What they're all called? they're all solo scores for you or live other instruments, other players. Oh no, that's like they're pretty guitar driven actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. Nels is on a number of them. Ah, uh, Nels. So, yeah. Um, yeah. GE, Stinson. So yeah. That's a bunch. Yeah. Um, where where are, are those? Can I hear? Can we hear them? I mean, can I hear them? Where are they? Just Do you still have a movie? Oh, the, so the films. Yeah, I mean, the only one that came out as a soundtrack, a partial. Yeah. One cut on a soundtrack. I did a film for IRS, uh, um, and that one. That one had two Jennifer Beale songs on it, one piece by me, and then some other uh, groups like Concrete Blonde and, yeah. you know, so 90s stuff, you know. So how many albums have you put out through Nine Wins on your own, if you had to count them up? I have no idea. I never counted. Ballpark. You mean the label? Yeah. But label. I'm not on all the ones on the label. Well, I mean, that's just what the label put out because it's well, about well, 200, 200 or 100 and something. Yeah. yeah, close to 200. Can people still, can they still, can we still get all those? Or? Yeah, you can get them from uh, a downtown music gallery or, mm -hmm. or Cadence Music. But none of them ever went digital, so they're not on any of the they digital They were services. on digital, and you can, if you're like, go to school here, you can you can hear <laughs> the whole catalog on DRAM. Oh, on the CalArts internal yeah. thing. It's so, so DRAM is like, a whole bunch of independent labels mm. and they stream 24 7 yeah and then uh and and you you give it's for educational use only mm -hmm. you can't download it and you can hear all the all the all the music on the, on the label right i think they have almost everything so how come you never oh they don't have the dvds because they only want uh, audio but how come you never just took it Passed it off to a digital distributor and then well for put a while Cadence did that they yeah. had uh, um, they had something like North, uh, North Country Distribution yeah. they had a digital aspect but they just stopped yeah that's that's yeah, yeah. I and 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 basically I started doing things with like places like Amazon and stuff but like I would look on Amazon they'd sell the record for you know sixteen seventeen dollars and I'd get five bucks well it's not just not forget about it well the digital side's even worse because you'd release it on you know all the digital services yeah. and you'd get like 0 0.001 yeah. per play my, my favorite is Bandcamp. they're the yeah. fairest one of the whole thing and i'm behind them 100 way plus they support like like you know ross hammond yeah so ross did this thing for um Grand parenthood maybe or something mm -hmm. like that we all contributed some music and and uh and Bandcamp said we won't take any money all the money will yeah, go yeah. directly to the charity. Yeah. So I'm behind people like that 100%. That yeah. yeah. I did a gig, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and I sold a box of CDs. Yeah. A box at 10 bucks a piece. That's 300 bucks. Yeah. You know? That's a lot of money for, for um, I don't care, you know, like what strata you're on. It's still a lot of money, you know? Yeah. So it's the, sometimes the difference between, I mean, it's not always sell a box but like even if you sell three or four that's money you know yeah. money you didn't have before it's gas money it's whatever you know yeah I, i'm not annoyed when it comes to that stuff you know? no i was i was gonna make a joke about wondering how many how many of the people bought them were in walkers were using walkers but you know because it's cd well so don't laugh about CDs that you want to hear anymore. something funny okay you, you remember walker? you remember um, <laughs> rob blakesley he was a yeah. trumpet player from portland mm -hmm. okay so one time these guys book gigs and he didn't know where they were but one of the gigs we show up and it's a nursing home <laughs> this is serious like old people well that's nursing. good that's so a good thing to do he freaked out he said well what are we going to do what are you going to do and the band said like just play your music man mm -hmm. just play your music put it out there if they don't like it we'll just do one set and we'll leave okay we we do the gig people are coming up like crazy. He sold two boxes of CDs. Two boxes of CDs. At the old right? age home. He had to get his wife to mail him more CDs for the rest <laughs> of the tour. Right? And they were just going like, oh, I want to buy two. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, well, you know, because he's an old folks. So and he's going like, are, are you sure you want two? He says, yes, I want one for myself and one for my daughter. She likes this kind of music. 
And well, that was the, that was that. Well, I mean, why didn't should... why didn't that start the uh, the old age home tour for you guys? <laughs> yeah, I had no coming idea soon that, enough. I had no I don't idea really that was need a thing. to No, I don't mean checking in. I mean, like, oh, yeah. you realize you're like a real pioneer of indie label, take control of your own destiny, release well, your own music. Mingus right. did it in the fifties. Charles Mingus did it in the fifties, and yeah. Sonora did it. Also, yeah. right after the fifties, only he, at first he just did singles, yeah. and they were like doo wop singles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean. It, his, the singles thing has just been released, actually. It's, it's a double CD set, and the stuff is from, like, his music to, like, these swing guys back with Fletcher Henderson. It's yeah. really amazing music. And a lot of doo-wop. I mean, really a lot of doo-wop, which is not surprising because he was the pianist with Winoni uh, Harris, who's the person who supposedly gets the the rock and roll, the word rock and roll comes from Winoni. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, what was the impulse? I mean, you know, well, to do it, to take it on your own, to, to I mean, that's, all right. instead I'm of going, a, instead I'm of going a, out. I'm a guy who didn't know anything about music, and I start playing music, and I'm playing with good people. Yeah. And I look around and I see James Newton, and James is young, a little young, younger than I am, yeah. and he decided to put out his own music on his own label. He put two records out. Right. And then I look at John Carter, who was older than me and he put out a, a thing and and i helped him right do that so so there was really no choice like who the hell is going to put out something by some guy right. who's you know who just started playing who doesn't know you know i mean i had john carter alex klein roberto mm -hmm. miranda and me right it's a great band but still it's a west coast band no right. one gives two shits about the west coast i mean it's like the west coast is like if it's not 1961, no one cares anything about the West Coast. Right, right, right. You know, they don't, they're got their has, heads up their asses when it comes to that. Yeah. They don't really understand the hit that most of the, all this music that they revere so much came from Los Angeles, transplanted from LA to New York City. Right. You know, I mean, I'm from New York. Yeah. But all you have to do is read a book and see, but don't read, you know, West Coast jazz because it'll stop in 1961. <laughs> but all you have to do is read a book and, and see, like, where these people came from. Yeah. Eric Dolphy, you know, I mean, first bebop tenor players come from here. Yeah. Um, Charlie Parker spent a lot of time here because the people already were very conversant with bebop. Yep. You know, I mean, it wasn't all New York. I mean, Howard McGee is from here. You know, Wardo Gray was out here, not totally a bopper, but still. Mm -hmm place the roots for being the first bebop guy you know i mean all this stuff i mean bob bradford was here in 53 mm -hmm. ornette was here already working as an elevator operator <laughs> you know i mean all that stuff was like laid the groundwork was all laid out for all this music yeah then they go to new york they get that and then new york gets the rep for it yeah mingus too mingus too all the yeah. workshop shit all the tunes that he's famous for <laughs> written here yeah you, Almost all. But I wasn't, I actually wasn't aware that all of those guys were put, had their own, they were putting all their own stuff out on their own labels at that James point. put two out. Yeah. And uh, the second one had Dresser and, and had a Coda yeah. one on a couple of cuts. And John put out one. I was working as a, at a second as studio in Venice, and yeah. I got him a pretty good deal to do it. I was working in exchange for studio time. So yeah. I got him a good, really good deal. And he did it, and we just followed through. And, uh, and I put the first one out, then I put the second one out, and I put the third one out. By the time I put the third one out, that's like one every year. And then there were 200 and, later, and you're well, done. Well, no, but I mean, like people would say, listen, <laughs> you know, we have some of your stuff already. Are you, gonna, are you just going to do you? Right. Which was a great question. I said, oh, you know what, I don't think about that. And I did people who were close to me, like Nels. Nels, is, right. Nels Klein's first record's on, on, my, yeah. on my label, and he also... Um, he also, his first recording is uh, Open Hearted, which was my second record. Which I actually, funnily enough, just heard the other day. Really? Yeah. I hope it stands up. It's a pretty good. Bikita Carroll sounds yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. He sounds phenomenal. It's a great album. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good when I did it. Yeah. You know? That's why I do these, actually, is because I just learned a whole bunch of shit about you that I had no fucking idea. So there's this, there's this whole, um, there's this whole thing. So I've been, since I've been teaching, you know, music classes mm. you know there's this idea sort of over history that like 
you know, the film music composers are over here, you know, and visual music media composers over mm -hmm. here, and then you've got like the real composers over here. And what I'm starting to find out from all the research I've done, from Prokofiev through to Feldman even did it, that yeah. every single guys. one, every single, oh, not every, yeah. but very many composers who I never would have thought had scored mm -hmm. films actually did some film scores. And yeah. it, they either kept it quiet because it's like, it's not the thing they wanted to be known for, or, you know, they just did it and it kept quiet on its own. But it's really interesting the uh, the amount of composers who have met. Ellington's, who have done Ellington's got two. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, um, um, uh, Mingus did some stuff for Carcevetes, but mostly for theater. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, uh, Mingus did stuff with John Cassavetes. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff. They were they he did a lot of stuff with John Cassavetes. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. did not know that. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know how friendly, but they were friends. Yeah. Some, something about a play about something. I don't think it was like the uh, the one that Jackie McLean did. Yeah. Like the the fix or the something like that. Freddie Rebel was in yeah. there. But I don't. I don't remember which one it is. But um, but he did something for Cassavetes, a, a, a play that Cassavetes wrote. Yeah. And that's really fascinating, actually, because you know most of those guys, especially the, you know, you talk about art guys. Yeah, you know, art, art guys. Yeah, you know, most of those guys, especially the abstract expressionists, were were big um, um, jazz buffs, yep. and they liked the free stuff, of course. You know, uh, uh, and even Larry Rivers played saxophone. He played with Elvin. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, all the. <laughs> I remember because like, uh, like, <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> this is really terrible. But like, when I was coming up, like. You know, when I bought my first saxophone, uh, they, they said, like, uh, the musicians I knew would say, like, so what are you going to do with that? I said, well, I'm going to play and I'm trying to learn it and stuff like that. And they'd say, like, uh, okay, so some time went on, you know. And uh, I said, well, Elvin's playing at the at the uh, at Skogs. I'm going to go see him. You want to see him? Who's playing horn? Some guy named Larry Rivers. No, I'm not going. Why not? Oh, he's a painter who plays saxophone. Don't be like him. Don't be like him. That's what guys, his musicians yeah. would say. Like, don't be like him. Saxophone player plays the horn. Uh, that's who, who paints. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Then I find out Miles, Ornette, Braxton, they yeah. all painted. Yeah. They all were like painting and, and drawing and doing all this stuff. Yeah. You know, like, like big time. That's how I met Ornette, actually, because no one, he wouldn't talk to musicians so much but he would talk to other artists yeah know? so he asked me the first thing he said i said oh mr cohen i really enjoy your music i said it's it's really inspirational he said oh are you a musician well he had a high voice and i said no i'm a i'm a painter oh and we had this a half hour talk so you lied, really you lied to ornette <laughs> no i didn't play them I didn't even have, I didn't even have a horn. I didn't start until I, was, I didn't start until I was 25. I did a gig the first year I had the horn. Yeah. I was like a, in a folk rock band that had some jazz things in it. It was really fun. And then you know we were doing a tour, and then we hit New York, and then of course you know yeah. that big big pro guys came in and did that stuff. Band broke up. But that's um, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So going from, you know, your career, film, and the indie thing, and all the stuff that you've done now to teaching improvisation over the last how many years have you, have you been teaching? Uh, well, I started right out of college. I was a grade school teacher. Yeah. I taught sixth and seventh grade uh, in Jersey, and I did some stuff at the school that I graduated yeah. from, New York Institute. Uh, I taught some painting, some just sub for classes. You still I taught, paint? I taught drawing mostly. Do you still paint? No, I draw though. And I use the computer for uh, animated graphic notation. So I've been uh, working with this, one of the guys here, this guy, Michael cool. Sproggins. And he has this program and I go in it, virtual reality and actually paint. And I use that and it's animated, it's, it's, it's moving. Yeah. And and then you you, edit that and project that 
and then you have musicians play it as graphic notation only it moves nice so it's it's going through yeah i'm going to do one project eventually with the like three panel screened and then me interpreting it on on contrabass flute with electronics i'm working on that now nice. that's what i'm working on now but i've been here yeah. 20 years at cal arts yeah so i was going to ask you how your how your concept your improvisational concept has changed for teaching after teaching it so long has it changed since where you were and 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 where you are now well to say anything over time like that didn't change you'd be really screwed up i mean you'd be pretty static <laughs> as, well, a, you know. as a human you know yeah um i i'm teaching two courses one is about stylists and innovators. Yeah. So people who are innovators and and then people who copy that and become represent, representations of the mm -hmm. original guy. Of which you know there, there are quite a like me. quite a few. Well, like anybody until that you know you don't know what factor you are in the innovative thing, and if you're concerned with that, then you're in the wrong business anyway. No, so I'm just saying I'm a, actually a, just a simulation of, of myself anyway has it did you start out with that or did you have well, that I developed over the I years started just as a painter it? and yeah. i'm thinking about it in the sense of of creating a good composition because an improv is a, a spontaneous composition mm -hmm. and a composition is like something you can edit basically that's the difference you can go back and erase this part fix this part Okay, now I have my, my, here's my catharsis part. Mm -hmm. You know, you can fix things. In improv, you can't fix anything. It well, just you, if you going. edit it after, like I'm going to do. Well, know. yeah, but see, then that's, the improv's over. The improv part is over. Now you're making a composition out of it. Yeah, that's true. It's a different thing. Yeah. You know? So you're talking about these things with yeah. students, and they have their interaction, and they're giving you input, which is wonderful because then you, you have, another perspective of how you're going to do that yeah. then they ask questions and then you can answer to the best of your ability in your from your experience yeah. and i've been fortunate to play with you know like everybody from braxton and george lewis to horace tap scott and john carter to patty smith and and uh, and uh, um vince spell yeah so that's a that's that's like talking about like going from totally outside music or composed music all the way down to you know Texas folk music. Yeah. So you know, and I started in blues bands and all that stuff. So the elements are all, all the same. So I, the other thing to that we talk about in improv is like the history of it. The people who are key people, who may have influenced a certain way, that maybe I play or somebody else yep. plays, and what they're adding to the vocabulary of the instrument, and then it gets down to that person's vocabulary. You know, then we can say like, okay, so when I play with you, I can't use my full vocabulary. Why not? Because you're coming out of it from, let's say, just for now, let's just say you're coming out of it from a more traditional jazz background. So you're more concerned with this, this, and this. Yeah. And so this more textualized part, I can't use. because so I have to figure out a way to fit it into your thing. And when I do it, you, you're not responding in that way or... Yeah. So I'm not saying anybody's good or bad or this is better than the other. I'm just giving a person analogies like, you know, like, okay, you're, you're thinking about what to play. How do you know? Because when you came in, you came in at the point you left the music and the music's like water. <laughs> it moved all the way to yeah. here. And we're working with this area, but you, you came back in over here when, when you started talking to yourself. Yeah. So, so things like that. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that. Like, like, you know, finding um, similarities in architecture, sculpture, painting, drawing, yeah. uh, uh, writing, yeah. you know, things like that, where, where when you, when you enter into this kind of realm of like, of like personal interaction, <clears throat> you're not really thinking from it from here, you're thinking as the music's out here, and then it's like, like a, you can take something out and you can put yeah. something in, but you have to maintain the connection. Like in Indian music, if you don't listen and go more deeply into the listening part, then you can't really you can't really play that music. Yeah. So those are things we talk about.
and it's changed my playing in the sense of making it more open because the students all come from a different place. So I have to be able to play with them. So it may mean like honing up on maybe extend, well, I don't want that word, but you know, but more like multiphonics and extended range and, and more quarter tone approach. And over here it might be more of a time swing approach. Yeah. So, you know, so my playing gets more grounded from the students actually. Cool. That's all. Yeah. That's I mean, awesome. I've been playing with the same, <coughs> my band is, all my bands are mostly all students, not former students. And, and and I'm still learning from them, and hopefully they're learning from me. And we have a good time, and we, and they can play everything that I write, and they don't complain. Well, they can. We we all can almost play everything I write. <laughs> That's that includes me and includes them, and yeah. they, they would agree with that. You know, sometimes they have a higher percentage than me. Sometimes I have a higher percentage, but you know, it's different. It goes yeah. in that way, and then and and uh, we push each other. Cool. It's really great. Well, dude, thanks for doing this. Yeah. And uh, we'll guess we'll play some music. Okay. <laughs>